Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to our 80th episode of explaining the faith. We've done 80 of these, praise be to God. As I've said, I've gone back to seminary and I'm now taking you with us. And so this is an honor and a joy for us. When we started this back in the, when COVID started, we had no idea we were gonna keep going. And uh, you know, of the 80 episodes, uh, 72 of these on YouTube have over 50,000 views. And when you add Facebook to that, probably over 100,000 views. So praise be to God. I, I just saw an article that said of the 100 most watched TV programs last year, of the 191 were sports events. Of the top 100 most viewed uh, TV programs of last year, 91 were sporting events. And so this is, tells me where our prior, now I'm a big sports fan, so don't get me wrong, but this tells us where our priorities are. So praise be to God that you're with us for watching something that's a little bit more important. Maybe not as fun, but definitely more important. And so before we begin our prayer, today we're gonna to be talking about the epiphany. And if you saw our EWTN show on Wednesday, which we do every Wednesday at 6.30, join us on EWTN for Living Divine Mercy, we talked a little bit about the epiphany. And today I'm gonna to start with just a little recap of that that. But stay with us, because if you watch it, you might say, well, gee, I already heard Father Chris talk about this. No, only the first few minutes of this will be a recap of what we talked about in EWTM, but then we're going to go into much more. And so you can't get more important to loving your faith than knowing it, and that begins with the church calendar. We have to understand, I never understood what was going on in the church calendar until I went to seminary. And now as I'm learning what's happening and why the church calendar is the way it is, I remember sitting in seminary going, why doesn't the whole world know this? And so my little bit of, of uh, offering to God is trying to help teach that. And thank you for joining us as we go back to seminary. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for the gift of the revelation of your Son. As the epiphany means revealing, we open our heart to receive that gift of which you have revealed to us in Christ your Son. And in this time of the epiphany, let us, through the intercession of our blessed Mother Mary and Saint Faustina, grow closer to you. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good again to have you with us. And as I mentioned, uh, you saw in the slideshow, we're talking about the Epiphany. And this is also known as Three Kings. It comes from Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading the scripture because we're going to assume that you probably know the story of the birth of Jesus and when the wise men came bringing the uh, gifts of, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then how Herod tried to kill all the young boys because he heard this king was born. And what were the wise men looking for? Now, sometimes you might hear me say wise men, sometimes magi, sometimes three kings. It's all the same, but we're going to explain some important differences and add to what you heard on our EWTN show last Wednesday. So praise be to God and thank you for joining us. Now, the Feast of the Epiphany, the Epiphany of our Lord is one of the oldest Christian feasts we have and one of the most misunderstood and forgotten. And that's why it's so important for me to help explain to you why we need this feast and why we celebrate it. Now, epiphany is a word that comes from the Greek that means to reveal, as I said. So it's a time where Christ is revealed as the Son of God to us. Now, the fact that he was born on December 26 was just the beginning. We have a lot more to it. So the feast, as you may have heard, um, Benedict Groeschel used to say all the time, is called a theophany. A theophany also means a revelation, a revelation of God to man. That's why the book in the Bible, the last book is called the book of Revelation. 
It's a theophany revealing what to us? Oh, well, Father, the book of Revelation is about the rapture and the Antichrist. No, it's not. You know what's being revealed to us in the book of Revelation? The mass. And that's a whole nother talk that we hope that you'll join us for. Um, and I've done some in the past on that. Now let's look at our next slide that Brother Mark can put up because the epiphany is basically all about divine mercy. This is why, well, Father, you guys are divine mercy priests. Why are you talking about all this? Because what you see on your screen right there is the image of divine mercy. And that image of divine mercy is what the epiphany is all about. God sharing his love with us. You can't get greater than giving his son. And we're going to go through all of this. Now, epiphany also means mystery of the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ to all people. So let's take a look at our next slide. Now, when we talk about a manifestation, how has God been manifested? How has Jesus been manifested to us? All right. The epiphany <coughs> was originally, we always think of the three kings now, the wise men, but it was more. The first and understood way to celebrate this day of the epiphany was originally in four different events. The first listed on your screen is the nativity. That makes sense. God has revealed to man by being born. Christmas, okay, or now Christmas, but at the time it was all one. The nativity. Next we have the magi, the visit of the wise men, the three kings. It was revealed to the Gentiles, that being God. Next, we have the baptism of our Lord, which we celebrate tomorrow. And we're going to talk about this more, where what happened? The dove came down and revealed the God, the Father, saying, this is my son. And so God is revealed as Trinity, because the Holy Spirit came down in a dove. And he's, the voice of the Father said, this is my son. We have the whole Trinity there. And then finally, surprisingly, the wedding at Cana. All of these were celebrated as the epiphany. All four events. So the nativity is where God is revealed to us by becoming a man. And what's the main point of the incarnation? I bet you don't know this. I didn't know this till I went to seminary. You know, the main reason Jesus became man, yes, to die for our sins, but to reveal the Father. And when you look on the image of the Son, the image of divine mercy as the Holy Father said, it's the face of the Father's mercy. The purpose of the Son is to reveal the Father. We all came from the Father. Jesus' job is to get us back there. Jesus is the way to get back to the Father. Our ultimate goal, surprisingly, is not Jesus. What? Our ultimate goal is to the Father. Through Jesus, he's the only way. The way, the truth, and the life. And what is Jesus' goal? To take us back to the Father. And how does he do that? Right here at the Mass. That is what Jesus' sacrifice is to the Father. The whole Mass, the prayers of the Mass are not to Jesus. They're to God the Father through the sacrifice of the Son. But remember, they are one. We don't want to treat them like they're two different gods here. So when you say, well, Father, what do you mean we, our goal isn't Jesus? Yes, it is. Our goal is God, which includes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I got to be careful how I phrase that. But Jesus incarnate, his job is to reveal the Father to you. And that's what's happening. All right, so then, after the nativity, where Jesus reveals the Father, we had on that list the Magi. Here, Jesus is revealed as a king, this is why he got gold, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So what is gold for? Gold is a gift for a king. He also got frankincense, which means that he is divine or a high priest. It's a gift for a priest or a divine high priest. And then he got myrrh, which means he's a man, because that's a, that's a spice for burial at death. So basically at the Magi, Jesus is revealed as God, as king, and as man. All that happened at the visit of the three kings. Then next week, or tomorrow, I mean, we will celebrate the baptism. I just said a second ago, what does that reveal? The whole trinity. 
not just Jesus, but it says that the dove descended, descended. We heard the voice of the father say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then finally, the wedding feast at Cana. Because if Jesus was gold for a king, priest for frankincense, and man for, for myrrh, we also got to know he's, he's divine. And that's what happened at Cana. Changing the water into wine is the miracle at Cana. And that revealed he's divinity. So God has shown us in these four ways, the nativity, the visit of the Magi, the baptism of Jesus, and the wedding feast of Cana, God has revealed to you everything you need to know in one feast. And we don't even know what this feast is. 80% of Catholics didn't know what the word epiphany meant. And it's the whole basis of our faith. That's why you're with us. So the mystery of the rosary, when we pray the rosary, I've always noticed this, people say the second mystery, the wedding at Cana. The mystery is not the wedding. The mystery is the manifestation of our Lord being revealed as God and the miracle. That's the second mystery of the rosary, of the luminous mysteries. All right. So now what happened? If we have the nativity, the visit of the Magi, we have the uh, baptism of our Lord and the wedding feast of Cana, and they're all celebrated as the epiphany. Father, what are you talking about? They're no longer celebrated. No, they were split out. And so over time, the nativity was split out and it became its own feast called Christmas. We celebrate that on December 25th, all right? Then, for a while, the Epiphany then was still celebrated as the other three. The visit of the Magi, the baptism of our Lord, and the wedding feast of Cana. So for a while, those three were celebrated together. But before we split those out, there was a super good meaning here. This is called Christmas Tide. You all heard the term 12 Days of Christmas? We did a video with Brother Stephen in the 12 Days of Christmas showing that they're not just about secular things, but they're really a way to teach our catechism. Um, seven, instead of seven swans of swimming, six geese of laying, you had seven sacraments, six days of creation. Instead of five golden rings, you have the five books of the Torah. Instead of four calling birds, you had the four gospel writers. Instead of three French hens, you had the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Instead of two turtle doves, you have the two uh, testaments, Old Testament, New Testament. And instead of one partridge in a pear tree, you have Jesus the Christ hung to a tree, which now bears fruit. So instead of a partridge in a pear tree, you have Jesus hung to a tree. And the word pear means it was a fruit tree. Jesus is that tree that he was hung to now bears fruit. So this we've already done. I wanted to summarize all this. I've already talked about these in other videos. So anyway, the epiphany is the last day of Christmas tide, or as you hear it, the 12 days of Christmas. So the 12 days of Christmas are from Christmas Day, the 25th, up until the Epiphany. And now the Epiphany is usually celebrated January the 6th. But sometimes it's moved to the Sunday. Here in Boston and many other dioceses, it's moved to the first Sunday after January 1st. And that just year happened to be January 2nd. So we've already celebrated the Epiphany on January 2nd, even though technically it's January 6th. And we moved it because as Jesus told people about Moses, you hardened your hearts and the church knew that people probably wouldn't go to celebrate it during the week on January 6th. So they make it January 2nd on a Sunday. All right, God has to meet us where we're at sometimes, but Kind of a shame in one sense. All right, so why is this important? Okay, because the 12 days of Christmas, from Christmas Day to the Epiphany, are the ones that you're familiar with. As we said, Christmas began with the revelation of Christ to Israel. His birth, the nativity, and who came? The shepherds. Who were the shepherds? Jews. Christ was first revealed to the Jews. But then it ends 12 days later with the epiphany, which we now celebrate of those four things. We now link the epiphany with just one of them, the magi, 
the coming of the three kings, the wise men. That's what we think of when we say Epiphany today. Why? Because they were all split out. Nativity was moved to Christmas Day, and baptism was moved to the week after the Epiphany, and wedding feast of Cana is moved to the week after that. So guess what, everybody? Starting tomorrow at Sunday Mass, you're going to hear about the baptism, and then the Sunday after that, you're going to hear about wedding at Cana. So now when you go to Mass, you're going to be like, man, I actually know what we're going to talk about, and why? Because Father Chris explained it. So hopefully, it'll make sense to you as we continue. All right. So anyway, Christmas began with the revelation of Christ to Israel on Christmas, and that is the nativity to the Jews, the shepherd boys, he was revealed. Then, at the end of the Christmas season, the 12 days of Christmas, Christ is revealed now to the Gentiles, the three kings. Those are not Jews. That's the epiphany. So over the centuries, we separated the rest of them out. Now let's look at our next slide, because now we celebrate the epiphany, as I mentioned, just as the visit of the three kings on January the 6th. Now, that's what you see on your screen. The baptism, as I said, has been moved to the Sunday after the Epiphany, and that begins ordinary time. So guess what, everybody? Starting Monday, we're back in ordinary time. Then it breaks, ordinary time breaks, and we do Lent. Then we come Easter season, and then we go back to ordinary time. I know it sounds confusing, but we'll, we'll stay with us. We'll, we'll walk you through it. So then baptism is celebrated, as I said, tomorrow or the Sunday after the Epiphany, and the wedding at Cana is commemorated on the Sunday after the baptism, as I just mentioned. So these feasts, all of these feasts about Christ's divinity, which is the Magi, he's a king, the baptism, Jesus is Lord, Cana, he is divine, they all complement the feast of Christmas, which is his humanity. So these feasts of Christ's divinity, the epiphany, complete the feast of his humanity, Christmas. That's why the 12 days of Christmas are so important. The first day, Christmas, is a celebration of his humanity. 12 days later, the epiphany celebrates his divinity. Now, let's go to our next slide. In the West, as we said, the focus of the Epiphany has remained on the visit of the Magi. Now, who are the Magi? This is where it gets fun. So that was the recap that you may have learned. Now, the Magi were the non-Jews to who God came after he first came to the Jewish shepherds. Remember, the shepherds and the Magi are not the same. So the shepherds were Jewish. The Magi were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. All right. And in this way, God reveals himself to everyone. Jew and Gentile, right? Now, the word magi means wise men more than it means king. When we say three kings, we really should say three wise men. These magi were actually astrologers, which is why they noticed the star in the first place. They were astrologers. Now, even pagans. Now, let's go back, though. Astrology, Father, I thought was wrong. Yes, Matthew did not condone astrology, but it shows the acceptance that no matter how bad we are or pagan we are, we can come to Jesus. Astrology is not what we want to do. You don't want to go to palm reading and horoscopes and all that. It's not what the church teaches. So even pagans can respond to Jesus. All right. So the sin of taking Jesus for granted, like most of us Catholics do, is more serious than the pagans sometimes who don't even know him. So let's not take them for granted. Now, in comparing the wise men to the shepherds, we see a couple things. Jesus first came to the Jews, as I said, which are the shepherds, then to the Gentiles, the Magi. So basically, Jesus came to the humble and the ignorant first. That was the shepherds. Then to the honorable and the learned and the educated, the wise men. Jesus came first to the poor, the shepherds. Then to the rich, the Magi. So no matter who we are, rich, poor, smart, stupid, no matter who, God can come to us and God will come to us. So traditionally, people have had their houses blessed on this day. Did you know this? Try to get your house blessed as close to this time as you can. All right, next shot is very important because you see that door. If, if you don't know, if you've looked above doors, Father Kaz wrote it on above our door, 
you see 20 plus C plus M plus B plus 22. Right? You see that. All right? These stand for the three magi, C and B, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. Now, some people point out that it also is Latin for Christus Mansionum Benedic Benedicat, which means Christ bless this house. That's what you see when you see chalk written over the door, 20 plus C plus M plus B. So the three kings represented Europe, Arabia, and Africa. This is important because you see them different skin colors, different ethnic backgrounds. Christ going to the whole world. All right, so we said the 12 days of Christmas or Christmas tide now begins or ends, I should say. And this is when we should remove our Christmas decorations. You've heard me say that. You know, a lot of people leave their Christmas decorations up till just Christmas Day and then they take them down. No, we're supposed to leave them up through the epiphany. And some, you know what's cute? Uh, There's a few bishops that said, if you forget to remove your Christmas decorations on the epiphany, which is basically now January 6th or 8th, between the 12th, 2nd and the 8th, you got to leave them up all the way to February 2nd, which is Candlemas. That's a little tradition. All right, now, let's keep going because this is good stuff coming. Now, be careful. I mentioned this on the EWTN show. In Louisiana, God bless the raging Cajuns. Not in Louisiana. The epiphany is the beginning of the carnival season. The carnival season is the season before Lent. This is when all the indulgence happens. The rich food, rich drink, and carnal pleasures are indulged in. And this season, the carnival season, ends with the infamous Mardi Gras. Right? Mardi Gras right before Lent. Let's take a look at our next slide. You see those two girls? They're wearing beads. Now we want to pray that these Mardi Gras beads, which are sometimes used for, let's just say, impure things. Guys down at Mardi Gras will give girls beads to do something immoral. And I'm convinced that those beads mock rosary beads. And they're all running down in Mardi Gras with these beads all over their neck. They're holding beads. They're waving beads. It's a string of beads in a loop. And a guy will give a string of beads to a girl to be able to expose herself. And everybody cheers. It's crazy. It really is the devil's mockery of rosary beads. I can't think of anything more crazy and so let's pray that those people down there are enlightened to what's really happening and how the devil is really making that mockery out of our blessed mother and of Christ. Now also too, tradition is to sing Christmas carols. You don't hear any Christmas carols on the radio anymore, but the Christmas carols are traditionally sung on Epiphany. We used to, before COVID, sing every January 6th down at Red Lion Inn at the foot of the hill here in Stockbridge. We would sing our Christmas carols. And everybody would say, why are you singing them after Christmas? Because it's not the end of Christmas season yet. Christmas season doesn't end till next week, praise be God. All right, so let's talk about a few things that Scott Hahn brought up. Scott Hahn made some interesting comments. He says, an epiphany is an appearance. So therefore, at Christmas, we really see the face child or the child, the face of the child born that appears to the world. And he says the Magi coming in the Gospel of Mark shows the fulfillment of God's promises. Now, we all just think the story of Mark is by itself. Here come the Magi, Jesus is born, and the Magi come and give him gifts. Do you have any idea that this is rooted in Scripture so deep? I did not know any of this before seminary. And I'm going to share it with you right now. I think it's fascinating. All right. Now, laden with gold and spices, there was a journey that they took that made Queen of Sheba. Let's look at our next slide. This is the Queen of Sheba. I always laugh. My mom used to call my sister the Queen of Sheba. And so my mom would see my sister dressed up to go out, and she'd say, don't you think you're the Queen of Sheba? I always wonder, who's the Queen of Sheba? 
The Queen of Sheba came from Africa to honor the wisdom of Solomon. Now, she came with gold and spices. And the journey invoked the journey of Solomon to Solomon by the Queen Sheba and the kings of the earth. So here are all the kings of the earth with Queen Sheba coming to visit Solomon. And who is Solomon? The son of David. Who's Jesus? The son of David. So you got Solomon, the son of David, being visited by these kings who brought gold and spices. Now you got the true son of David, Jesus Christ, being visited by the kings bringing spices. This is interesting. This is 1 Kings 10 and 2 Chronicles 9. Now, interesting, the only place where frankincense and myrrh are mentioned together in the Bible, other than the, the gospel about Jesus and the three kings, is in the Song of Songs about Solomon. This is the Song of Songs, chapter 3, chapter 4. Here they came to visit Solomon, the son of David, and they brought, guess what, frankincense and myrrh. Now Jesus fulfills that as the true son of David. So let's look at our next slide. Because Jesus, when they came, is found with his mother. Just as David's son Solomon, right there in your picture, was enthroned alongside his mother. She's the queen mother. And so you have, this is fascinating to me. You have these kings from all over the world traveling to see the son of David, who is Solomon, and they found him enthroned next to his mother. Now we have the true son of David, Jesus Christ. Same thing. Kings travel from all over the world. Guess what? Bringing frankincense and myrrh and gold, and they come and find him enthroned next to his mother. I never learned any of this before seminary. Christmas was just, okay, oh, it's a made-up story. No, it's a fulfillment. It's a complete fulfillment. And this queen mother was important. Nobody went directly to the king. They went to the queen mother. If they had an intercession or the, the peasants needed help, they went to the king. Who was the king? Uh, sorry, who was the queen? The queen was the wife of the king, right? Well, the king had many wives. Solomon had hundreds of wives. So who was the queen? The first wife, the prettiest wife, the oldest wife, the youngest wife, the smartest wife? No, the queen was the mother. And that's who all the people went to to intercede before the king. Why would Jesus change that? He comes from the Davidic line. He's the son of David. So why would God change this? This is the role of the queen mother. Don't believe me? 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Now, the magi come to pay him tribute, as the same way kings and queens came to Solomon. This is 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 2. But now, fascinating. In the Luke chapter 11, verse 31, you remember this reading? Jesus was talking about the queen from the south would come. And he said, the queen of Sheba basically is the queen of the south, to, to admire the vestments of Solomon. Remember, Jesus said this, Luke chapter 11, verse 31. And he said, but there's someone here greater than Solomon. He's talking about himself. Fascinating. All of this. So Jesus coming is a fulfillment of these promises. The promises that go back to way into the Old Testament. Now the Magi, these were probably Persian astrologers. And they're following the star that was also in the Old Testament. Did you know this? I didn't. Before seminary. They followed the star that would, was predicted to rise over the house of Jacob. Guess where? Old Testament, Numbers 24, verse 17. The star was predicted to rise over the house of Jacob. This is who the per Persian astrologers were following. So centuries earlier, there's a story here. Again, never learn this. 
never heard a homily on this, never was taught this in catechism, was never taught this in Catholic school, grade school or high school. I didn't learn this to seminary. And this is why you're going back to seminary with me. Because earlier there was an evil king that wanted to destroy Moses and the Israelites. This is all in the Old Testament. So he summoned Balaam. And Balaam came from the east with two servants. But Balaam refused to curse Israel that this evil king wanted him to do and instead prophesied that a star would come and would rise out of Israel and be exalted by all the nations. Again, this is the Numbers, the book Numbers, chapter 22, 23, and 24. This is the star that the three Magi follow because like Balaam, they refuse to get involved with an evil king. Who was the evil king for the Magi? Herod. Herod. Their pilgrimage is prophetic. It's a sign. They come from afar, guided by God's light, bearing the wealth of the nations to praise Israel's God. This is all written in the Old Testament. And we just thought Jesus stood alone in his story with the Magi. It's the first I've ever heard about any kings. No, it's all there. And so we have to understand this. Now, Jesus has come to reveal to all the people that they are co-heirs to his throne, like to be part of the divine life of the royal family. All right? So we celebrate now our entrance into the family of God on Christmas and the Epiphany, the fulfillment of God's plan that all nations would be united with Israel as co-heirs to his fatherly blessings. St. Paul says this, and no, it's not a one-world government. All nations worshiping God does not mean we are a one-world government. No, we're not. The sovereignty of nations is still important. But we have Jewish roots. So we too must be guided by the root of David, that bright morning star that was talked about in Revelation chapter 22. And the light of the world was talked about in Isaiah 42. This is all fulfillment. As the Magi adored Christ in the manger, let us adore him on the altar in the Eucharist. As the Magi placed their gifts in the manger of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, place the gifts that you have of your intentions and your talents on that patent during Mass. We must offer to him our very lives in thanksgiving. That's what Mass is. The Eucharist means thanksgiving. So in thank you to God, offer everything back to him at the Mass. Nothing less than yourself will suffice for the king. No piece of gold, no spice, only yourself. This, let's look at our next slide, is the meaning in the mass, the highest point of the mass, when that priest takes that patent and that chalice, it's called the concluding doxology, and the priest raises it, and he says, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. What do you do at that moment of the Mass? You put your gifts, greater than gold, frankincense, and myrrh, into the manger. You're putting your gift of your very self onto that patent, and you say, Lord, I give myself to you. Do with me as you will. It may hurt, but do with me as you will. So Father Peter James Cameron, he's a Dominican. I was trained by the Dominicans, part of my training in seminary. He wrote some interesting stuff. He said, the Magi lived a life of privilege. For them, though, it wasn't enough. Benedict XVI referred to the Magi as men with restless hearts. They were questing for God, filled with expectation. They were looking for something greater. Hmm, interesting. Our own relentlessness 
restlessness, I should say, today. We're all on edge now. We're all restless. Is the fact that grace is prompting us to follow the Magi's lead. They were restless. They were looking for something more. You ever hear yourself say, there's got to be more something more to life than this? Going to work every day, trying to make more money, buying a nicer car. There's got to be more to life than this. Follow the example of the Magi. They had everything. They were rich. They said there's got to be more to life than this. So, this saving event of Epiphany is ongoing. It's not just this week. The Epiphany literally manifests the method by which God breaks into your life. The Epiphany. The Father does not send a teaching or a message, but His Son. His Son in the flesh. And so the Father is important here. Let's look at our next slide. God, will, this is from the Catechism. God willed both to reveal himself to man and to give him the grace of being able to welcome that revelation. So in other words, God both revealed himself and gave you the grace to accept it. Now that's how you're going to be judged. This is scary. Did you accept that grace? Did you accept it? So the epiphany is the offer of that grace. All right, let's keep going here. So now, Father William Saunders also adds to this saying that sometimes our English translation of the word for magi is astrologer. And he says the magi were therefore probably Persian astrologers who could interpret the stars. But more importantly, their visit fulfilled, as we said, the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, Psalm 72, I didn't even mention yet, speaks of how the Gentiles will come to worship the Messiah. Listen to this. This is from Psalm 72. The kings, notice kings of Tarshish and the Isle shall offer gifts. And the kings of Arabia and Saba shall bring gifts and tribute. All kings shall pay him homage. All nations shall serve him. Then Isaiah prophesies these gifts. He said, caravans of camels. He's already talking about the wise men here. And this is Isaiah way before Christ. Caravans of camels shall fill you. Dromedaries from Midian and Epha and from Sheba, Seba, uh, Sheba shall come bearing gold and frankincense and proclaiming praises of the Lord. That's Isaiah 60. So since the 7th century, the Western church has celebrated this. Amazing. Now, we talked about, tradition says their names are Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. I want to show something kind of cute because this is funny. When I was a little kid, you know the nativity sets? We had the three wise men, and one looked really mean, and he used to scare me. I was just a little kid. I, I was four years old, and I would look at those statues and one had a really mean look on his face he really really scared me i didn't know who they were we're going to show you who the three are right now if brother mark could put the picture up these are the traditional wise men the first one is the older guy with the white beard this is melchior he's the older one with the white hair and long beard he's the one who brought the gold then next we have the younger one the ladies would say more handsome this is Caspar. He's sometimes beardless. Sometimes he has a, a, a trim beard. He's the one who honored God for uh, the gift of frankincense for divinity, priest. And then third, we have the dark-skinned one. Sometimes you see, look like an African, because he was. The dark-skinned one, this is um, Balthazar. And he brought myrrh for the dead. And so the tradition here runs deep. Now, do you, do you have this confirmed by archaeological evidence? No, but that's what faith is. And so in Catholic Answers, Father Hugh Barber, he wrote something very interesting. He said, what did these wise men find? This is, this is a good one. Listen to this. He said, they didn't find what they expected. They didn't find a palace. They didn't find servants. They didn't find earthly power. They just found an infant. 
And what convinced them then that that infant was the king? Well, Father, all those prophecies that you talked about. Ah, the star, maybe? Yeah, Father, it was the star. The star led them there. That's what told them it was God. Actually, no. The star appeared and disappeared. St. Matthew gives us a hint to what or who made them prostrate and fall to their knees and offer gifts. You know what that is? Let's go to Matthew. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. They opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is awesome. Father Barber says, this mother had been the greatest sign of all, greater than any star in the heavens or any prophecy of the times. Mary was the convincing sign of the presence of the power of the king. Why? Because he was enthroned next to her, the queen mother. And when they walked in and it said they saw Mary, <clears throat> they knew. This is incredible. She has the power that leads us to recognize her son as king, as God, and as man. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All she needs to do is lift the veil from her little baby's face and show him to the world. Let's look at our next slide. Isn't that what Mary's doing in that picture? She's lifting the veil off the little baby Jesus. And look at the wise men. They're adoring. So Matthew basically says what caused these wise men to know that this was God was not the star, was not the prophecy, it was Mary. Then, Mary lifts the veil, then we will adore him. This is a theophany, a revealing of God. This is an epiphany, a revealing of God. And so now, we offer our own gifts, right? He desired, he didn't desire precious things that were given by the Magi. He desires your heart your faith, your hope, your love. So even if we have nothing to offer him except your weaknesses, your poverty, and your pain, and your suffering, those are more precious to Jesus than gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know why? Because you don't offer and give it to somebody you don't trust. And Jesus said the key is trust. So like with the Magi, Jesus has been waiting for us, waiting in the company of the Blessed Mother waiting for us. How do we find him today? Waiting in the company of the Blessed Mother. It's just like the Magi. He's calling us. He's revealing himself to us. And he's enthroned next to his mother. Wow. Now Mark Shea added to this. He said, one of the strange things today in our culture is the fact that people will look at the Magi and use them to validate astrology. Oh, well, gee, the Magi were astrologers, so I can read horoscopes. I can look at the heavens. At the same time, they dismiss the Bible. So they're using it and saying, well, the wise men were astrology, so I could follow astrology. That's going to be a topic of a whole other talk. But then they dismiss the whole Bible as just a fairy tale. Yes, Matthew does touch on this, but Matthew does not tell us that these were kings. We don't know. He tells us, he doesn't tell us how many there even was. So how did we come up over the years to know that they were kings and that there were three of them? Actually, the number three is pretty easy. Matthew never says there were three kings. He just said kings came. Well, how do we know there were three? That's pretty easy because there was a gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There were three gifts, so we generally say there were three kings. But how do we call them magi? Do you know the word magi comes from magic? Magic. 
Well, wait a minute, Father, I didn't think we were supposed to do magic. Well, stage magic, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you think magic is going to change your future, then there is something wrong with it. We shouldn't speak of them as magicians. Because back then, there was no separation between science and magic. Now there is. These were more men of science that we would know today, not magic. And so we have to not treat them as palm readers and, and um, tarot card readers, okay? Now, this is very important. They believe that everything was connected through the movement of the heavens. So they studied the stars and tried to understand the meaning of the movement of the stars. Well, we might then call them astronomers, not astrologers. You ever, you ever know this? People get really confused. Astronomy, astrology. Astronomy is supported by the Catholic Church. These are people studying literally outer space, uh, physics, movement of the planets. That's astronomy. There's nothing wrong with that. Astrology, stay away from because that's the false belief that somebody other than God can determine your future. Sorry, but Pluto spinning around, you know, the certain planets and the way they move is not going to determine your future who you marry. You and God do. That's why the church is against tarot cards, palm reading, crystal balls, seances, psychics. Don't fall for that junk. That's astrology condemned. Astronomy is if you want to be somebody who studies the planets and, and quantum mechanics. I had a course in college called quantum mechanics. So know the difference. This is very important. Now, let's take our next slide. What star did they see? Was there really a star? What star? We're not sure for sure. But here's what's interesting. We do know that Jupiter conjoined Saturn with Saturn three times in the seven months in 7 BC, which many people Jesus believe was born in 6 or 7 BC. That's only because the calendar dates have been switched over the years. All right. We also know that Mars joined Saturn and Jupiter and made a huge bright light. There's some people who speculate the star of Bethlehem may even have been when Jupiter went behind the moon in 6 BC and then came back out. And so when it came back out, it made this huge bright light. There's also an ancient Chinese chronicle. The Chinese have it documented that states that an object, probably a nova, which means a new star, was observed in March of the year 5 BC and remained visible for a long time, very bright. Well, that just proves that it was something natural. It wasn't, it wasn't supernatural. No, because God made it happen. God made it happen. So anyway, Christians, you don't have to think that science goes against religion. It doesn't. Christian theology saw in the three kings the first Gentiles to respond to Christ. So basically the bottom line, everybody, is God met the Magi where they were and used their own efforts and understandings to connect heaven and earth. He does the same with you. You know, John Sorensen talked a little bit in his work, The Magi. He said the traditional belief that there were three wise men, as I said, is based on three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Why else? Because those were used by smart people. <laughs> and they call them wise men. So the identification of the wise men as kings probably developed from Psalm 72 that says, may all kings fall down before him and all nations will serve him. That's where we think they became known as kings rather than astronomers. Now the nativity scenes that you see that have magi, this is interesting. See this nativity set? I don't know if Brother Mark can get close to the nativity set or not. You all have your nativity set? The nativity set includes the Magi. 
Do you know that most all theologians say that's wrong? Do you know that most theologians say if you want to be correct, you should take your magi out of your nativity set? Because this is the newborn Jesus. He was just born. And you see the three kings we have? There in the far corner is the dark one. That's Balthazar. He's from Africa. Then you have standing the younger one, which is Caspar. And then you have the one kneeling, the older one, which um, is uh, Melchior. But you know, most theologians tell us this is all wrong. And it doesn't matter. That doesn't change your faith. You know why? Matthew never said when they arrived. Do we believe that the Magi came? Absolutely. Magi, uh, Matthew said the Magi came, but Matthew never said when. So why do most theologians think that that scene is actually incorrect? They believe that the Magi didn't come for almost a year or two years later. Why? Because Herod wanted all boys under two years old killed. So that would have meant that this Christ child was already two years old when Herod found out. When Herod found out from the Magi that a new king had been born, he wanted all young boys two years old and younger killed. That would mean that the child Jesus could have been up to two years old. Well, he wasn't still in the manger at two years old. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't destroy my faith. I'm not saying the Magi didn't come to Jesus. They did. Matthew just doesn't say when. And so the nativity showing the Magi is probably incorrect. He didn't arrive till later. The scholars, biblical scholars, say that it may have occurred a year or a year and a half later because the king's Herod command in Matthew 2.16 to kill the children. The fact that Herod wanted all male children up to two years old killed suggests that the same time, that some time had passed before he ascertained the age of the Christ child from the Magi. Maybe a couple years. Matthew does not tell us, as I said, how much time elapsed between the birth of and the arrival of the Magi. I think this is fascinating. And again, I never learned that until seminary. So let's take a look now at a quick video. We're almost done. We've only got another page left. Let's take a look at a quick video. Because a lot of people say, the reason I don't believe in the Bible is it contradicts itself. And Matthew contradicts Luke. How do we explain contradictions in the Bible? I did a whole talk on that. If you want to find it, it's on our YouTube channel saying the Bible, a Catholic book. You can look it up. I did it last year. But for now, let's watch a two-minute video that talks about the epiphany and how we can explain those contradictions in the Bible. Some people say the nativity stories contradict each other because Luke does not mention the Magi or the wise men being present at Jesus' birth, whereas Matthew does. Now, this could be a case of Matthew recording a detail that Luke omitted. But guess what? Matthew didn't record the Magi being present at Jesus' birth either. Matthew 2.1 says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. As we can see, Matthew never says that the Magi were present at Jesus' birth. He only says that, in the days of Herod the king, the Magi came to Jerusalem, not Bethlehem. Oh, by the way, Matthew never said there were three Magi. That's a pious tradition that developed later based on the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the Magi brought Jesus. Matthew does tell us that after the Magi failed to return to Herod after visiting Jesus, Herod ordered all of Bethlehem's male children under the age of two to be killed. If the Magi had gone the six miles from Jerusalem to visit the newborn Jesus in Bethlehem and failed to return after a few days, then why would Herod need to kill toddlers? This implies that much more time had passed between Jesus' birth and the Magi failing to return to Herod, thus motivating Herod's plan to kill any child who could be the young king, who, by the time of the issuance of this decree, 
might have been two years old. Matthew 2.11 says of the Magi, Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. If Jesus was a toddler when the Magi visited, then the Holy Family were either permanently residing in Bethlehem after Christ's birth, before they later settled in Nazareth, or they were temporarily residing there, possibly with relatives, while they were away from their home in Nazareth. Either way, the detail about the Magi's visit is not a contradiction. Instead, it's a revelation of how God was made known or became an epiphany, not just for a few people in Israel, but for the whole world. Through this manifestation of the Incarnation, all people could eventually rejoice in the birth of God, their Savior. For Catholic Answers, I'm Trent Horn, and thanks for watching. So that was a good video explaining what Matthew was telling us in the scriptures, and uh, very powerful. Now, I want to show something, or let me say a few things first, actually. You know, um, a lot of people will claim that like Jesus' birth, the birth of certain pagan gods were also marked by a star. Well, therefore, this whole story of Jesus is pagan. No. Just because a star and a story might have been marked a pagan, some pagan god, doesn't make that the truth and the story of Jesus untrue. If, if, if you want to look at it that way. Um, the fact is, uh, a lot of people say, well, gee, this came from myths out of Egypt. No, there is no pagan connection. No pagan connection. Benedict, Benedict XVI says, these men could have been part of the pre, uh, Persian priesthood or not, but it doesn't matter. God meets you where you're at. If you're high and mighty, God will meet you up there. If you're low and, and humble, even greater in God's eyes, he'll meet you there. Let's look at our next slide because I wanted to share a reflection from our founder, St. Stanislaus. He's the founder of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And I think this is fabulous. It's one paragraph that I want to read to you. And I want you to listen very deeply because I promise you it applies to you. I promise. Listen to these words of our founder, St. Stanislaus Papchinsky, regarding the epiphany. He said, Consider that God did not send an angel to summon the Magi for the sake of paying honor to Christ, but showed them instead an unusual star. Because that's what happened, right? They, they were led by a star, not by an angel. Understand, however, that this was done by God on purpose, because in his supreme wisdom, he knew that they would be summoned more easily by a star, because they were astrologers or astronomers, than if he were to send them a different heavenly messenger. So basically what St. Stanislaus is saying is, to a guy who studied the stars, God is going to send a message to the stars. For they were star experts, and indeed anyone is drawn more easily by means known to him than by those unknown. Now this applies to you, I promise. Do you ever find yourself wishing that God would just send you an angel? I always say that. God, you sent Joseph an angel in a dream and told him exactly what to do. How come you don't do that to me? And he said, do you ever find yourself wishing that God would just send an angel to you or some other heavenly sign? Then you would know exactly what he wants you to do. I say that all the time. Rather, St. Stanislaus says, look at the ordinary signs around you that God has placed in your path what your boss at work asks you to do, what your teacher says, or your parents or your spouse. What does the church ask of you in her teachings or in the priest's homilies? What does Jesus ask of you in the scriptures? Sometimes we think the Lord isn't speaking to us, 
but most often he is in the most ordinary events of our lives. Huh. How does he speak to you? Through a beautiful sunset? A song? A hug of a family member? A child? It's our responsibility to pay attention and to be open to his working in this way in our everyday lives. If we don't, we might miss what he is asking of us and wanting to tell us. Don't miss it. Just because God doesn't send you a star or an angel doesn't mean he isn't talking to you. He's talking to you. You know how I always feel God's talking to me? I always say, when somebody brings up something to me the first time, eh. Somebody brings something up to me, a different person, and a second time, I'm like, hmm. A third time, I'm like, whoa. A fourth time, I'm like, okay, God, I know you're trying to tell me something. So, St. Stanislaus says, you are going to need to give God similar gifts. Instead of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, something similar but better. The gold of praise, the frankincense of prayer, and the myrrh of mortification. Praise, prayer, and mortification better than gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But if you have not yet gathered these most precious riches, meaning you're not praying, you're not mortifying yourself, you're not praising God, he says, work hard to do it, to be eager to imitate Christ in all that you do. Every day there are many opportunities to praise him, to pray, and to offer penance and sacrifice. Remember, don't forget, we challenged you every day do a work of mercy, and on Fridays an act of penance. I haven't forgotten those. I haven't been reminding you of them lately, but we challenge you to do that. Last half a page. Consider that God foresaw the violent death that Herod was preparing for those children, including the Holy Family, Jesus. So the Magi did not go back to the tyrant, but returned by a different way. Right? When God informed them. Herod said, come and tell me so that I too could go worship the Christ child. What a bunch of bunk. He wanted to kill the Christ child. So God warned them because they were open to the signs and they went home by a different way. God also foresaw the rune. You know, he foresaw the rune of the Christ child and warned the Magi not to tell Herod. So God foresaw that there could be a real problem. God too foresees you could have a problem. If you continue by being allured by your senses and you return on the same road you used to travel. Notice the Magi went home by a different road. They came in the road of pagan and they left on the road of a faithful believer. You too, probably, if you're like me, came in on the road as a pagan. If I look at my college life, whew, that was the life of a pagan. If I return to that road the same way, just like they were warned, the, the Magi were warned, don't go back on the same road. You're going to find ruin. Herod's going to get you. I too came to God through a road as a pagan. If I go back on that road, allured by my sensuality and drinking and girls and parties, it's going to be ruin. Instead, go back by the other road. Like the Magi went back by the road of faith, came from the road of the pagan, left by the road of faith. We, coming to God as we've in a sinful past, now need to go back on a different road to God through the road of faith. I think this is fascinating. God himself warns you not to return by the same way. Your home is heaven. Where one arise, arrives by no other way 
than Jesus Christ on the cross. So basically abandon your own way and proceed by the road of the cross. Yeah, that's not fun. The earthly terms tell me that the parties and the girls, that was much more fun than the road of the cross, the road of the priesthood, going to bed every night alone the rest of my life. The world tells me this is no fun. The world tells me that other road I was on is much more fun. But look what the scripture tells us where that road leads. St. Faustina says she saw that road and people were dancing and having parties and then they fell off a cliff. And then she saw another road that was rocky and thorny. Our road as Christians, if you're really leaving it, is rocky and thorny. It's about sacrifice. There's no time for yourself. Days are 6 a.m. to midnight every night. Constant work, ministry, preparing talks, managing people, doing homilies, doing the mass. It's beautiful and I've never been happier. But the world will tell me that's not as fun. But that rocky road, the road of sacrifice, not having a wife and children, that road led to heaven. That's a personal sacrifice for me. You may not be called to a religious vocation, but your personal sacrifice of getting up every day, preparing meals, getting breakfast, getting the kids off to school, going to work, being hassled by your boss, putting in a full day's work, getting stuff in traffic, coming back, having to make dinner, fighting with your spouse, having to pay bills, and then going to bed exhausted and having to do it all over again. That's your thorny road if you're faithful to that if you're faithful to your family and your loved ones. So having abandoned the way of the road that we all would want to be joyfully singing and parting is not the way to heaven. The way to heaven is the way of Christ. So take that road instead. Take that different road. That's the message of the three kings. I bet you've never heard that. I know I didn't. <laughs> As I was just coming out of college, I was like, I don't know if I want to hear that. But I did, and now I embrace it. So to finish, let's finish with a little segment called Mary, the Three Kings, and the Three Herods. All right, after giving birth to Jesus, Mary and Joseph waited for their hearts and minds of men to be opened. So here's Mary and Jesus, Joseph. They give birth to Jesus, right? Okay, so there's Mary and Joseph. They give birth to Jesus. And now they're waiting for the minds and hearts of men to be opened. The word epiphany, as we said, means manifestation. But it also means a sudden insight or revelation. Now here's what's important. Both definitions apply to this incredible event. All right, through the Magi, Christ was made manifest to the world. They came, they saw, they told the world. Through revelation of the prophecies of the Old Testament, they grasped the significance of what they were called to, to see, to witness. And so these wise men chose to follow Christ, not go back the same road to Herod. This is interesting. As Anne Tansy put it, quote, the wise people of the world are on Mary's side of this epic struggle with the Herods of the world. In a sense, they are almost outnumbered, like the three kings from the east were outnumbered by Herod's army. You had three little, three little wise men, and they were on Mary's side, went home by a different road, totally outnumbered by Herod. Herod represents the world. Harold and his henchmen represent the world today, trying to tell us what's fun, what's good, and that you're a bigot or that you're a hater because you stand for Christian Catholic teaching. So what does it mean to be on Mary's side and what is this epic struggle? It's the battle between good and evil. Mary's side seeks to protect the life of her son when Herod was trying to kill this is like abortion. The world trying to kill babies, just like Herod. God declared that evil. 
Yet the world of the Herods trying to tell you, take the life of the innocent child is a right. Hogwash. It's a battle between good and evil. Threatened by, by goodness, our politicians, our world wants to stop it because it interferes with their pleasure. That wrong road. The three kings counterbalance the Herods. Let's look at our last slide. The New Testament speaks of Herod. The trio of Herods. You know there were three Herods? I always was confused by this in high school. We'd read about one Herod, then another Herod. I'm like, who's Herod? All right, the first was Herod the Great. He's the one in the Epiphany story. He slaughtered the innocent children. Then his son, Herod Antipas, succeeded him. He's the one that had Mary's nephew killed. Who was Mary's nephew? Oh, come on, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So that was his son, Herod Antipas, that had Mary's nephew, John the Baptist, beheaded. Then the third Herod was Herod Agrippa. He was the one who martyred St. James and threw St. Peter into prison. Now, fortunately, Mary's husband Joseph and the Magi, they were on Mary's side. They were warned by the angels about Herod and his treachery. Today, we too are being warned. How are you being warned about the Herods of the world? By watching this video by hearing the homily at Mass, by reading the Catechism, by reading the Scriptures, by following church teaching, especially regarding life. The wise men returned via another route, we said, didn't report to Herod as Herod wanted them. Joseph protected his family by also going a different route. He went to Egypt. These are the men on Mary's side. They hear the word of God and they follow. Herod hears of a king being born and wants to destroy that king. He sees the Messiah's arrival and he wants to be the only king. Does that not sound like our politicians today? I heard um, <laughs> one of the uh, congressmen say, Miss Speaker, you are not God. <laughs> And I thought, wow, that's a pretty good statement. <laughs> no, Miss Speaker of the House, you are not God. And so I find this very interesting. So in our Epiphany story, Mary is a protagonist of love and Herod is the antagonist of hate. We need to know the difference. The Magi and Joseph are on Mary's side. So do we need to be. God gives us a choice. What side are we going to be on? I've given you the choice of life or death. Now, a lot of people will read that and say, well, he was speaking spiritually. Yeah, that's true, but he was also, I think you could say, speaking literally. Are we choosing in this world life or death? And that, I think, is the message of the Epiphany story. As the child found life because Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. God bless you. Thank you for being part of episode 80. And God bless you as we pray with God's willing uh, to have many more coming up. Join us on our EWTN show every Wednesday at 6.30 as well. If you have EWTN, you can live stream it. And in, we let you go. Let us show... On the slides, Brother Mark can put up, join our Marian family. You know, micprayers.org is a website you could go to. It takes just 10 seconds. doesn't cost anything. But you can go to micprayers.org and become a Marian helper. What is a Marian helper? Basically, a Marian helper is our Marian family. All of you who've joined us. doesn't cost anything, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Even if you can never donate a dollar, that's okay. God brings different people for different reasons. 
Now, if God brings you and he puts on your heart to help us build our new monastery and donate, God bless you. But if he also calls you to come here to receive the grace of our masses, our rosaries, our prayers, our penances, just like you were a Marian of the Immaculate Conception. I find it funny because I always thought becoming a priest, okay, well, you know, the good thing is I'm going to get a lot of graces. Do you know that you can get the same graces I do? You can get the exact same graces I do by giving up my life and becoming a priest. You can get the exact same graces as any one of us Marian fathers by being a Marian helper. And that's not us saying it. That's a decree of the Holy See because we are what's called a spiritual benefit society. And when you become a Marian helper, you're part of a spiritual benefit society. So God bless you. We hope you join us and be part of our Marian family today. And if you'd like to learn more about a divine mercy, you can see uh, my DVD out there called Explaining the Faith. This, uh, we're hoping to generate more, but this is the original 13 talks, very, very th deep in our, our theology. You can get that at shopmercy.org or 800-462-7426. And on that same website, if Mark can go to the next slide, you can get my book called Understanding Divine Mercy, which helps you understand it. And then finally, if you're struggling in any way, not just suicide, but any depression, anxiety, or you've lost a loved one, you're suffering in any way, please get our book, After Suicide. There's hope for them in you. It's not just about suicide. It's about any kind of suffering or loss to help you get through it. And I tell you what, I'm not up here doing a sales pitch. You can't afford these books. You can't afford that DVD. Write to me. Send us an email. I'll send it to you for free. It's not about the money. Yeah, we got to eat. We got to keep the lights on. We got to keep the videos going. We got to pay for the cameras, all that stuff. But God will send that. And if you're one of them that God puts on your heart to help us with that, God bless you. But if not, don't worry about it. You say, Father, I really want that book on divine mercy. I'll read it. I really need it. I'll send it to you for free. Otherwise, if you can afford it, you can get it on shopmercy.org and all the proceeds go to help our ministry. God bless you. And on this special time of the epiphany, never forget the reason for the season because Christmas season ends tomorrow, the feast of the baptism of our Lord. Now, don't say I didn't know that because I just told you that in the talk. <laughs> so God bless all of you. And until next week, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.